congratulations, Ned, on uh, this uh, happy birthday party. And um, you reminded me of one of the one of the good things I uh, luckily stumbled into as I arrived, which is uh, helping you to uh, get this started. You have uh, made us think big and think broadly and think widely and. I hope think wisely for so long that I'm incredibly grateful and it was an unbelievable treat for me to be able to help you in those early days. You should be sure of that. I wanted to start with this. There was a feshrift uh, on this, but as I was thinking about today, I was thinking about a uh, an early uh, morning, cold morning, November. Uh, 48 years ago when I was a sophomore uh, at Harvard and I opened this book uh, which uh, Janet Yellen assigned your chapter and uh, I read that in uh, Briggs Hall and I said I want to be an economist wow that is so exciting and that was a thrill uh, this was uh, just mind-blowing for me what one could learn and think and uh, it was you Ned that uh, made made that inspiration and uh, you've been inspiring us uh, all the way before then then and through all the activities of, of this center I, I want to discuss the big question because you ask the big questions uh, and that is uh, what will be capitalism in the 21st century and of course capitalism is a a big loaded word that means vastly different things in different places so i don't want to spend uh, 30 minutes on semantics uh, but i do want to argue in the brief remarks that we will have a very different kind of economy i believe in the 21st century from the kind of economic life that we have had in the 20th century. That will be true in the United States and it will be true globally. And the institutional differences will be so different that I think it will be right to describe it uh, when we get there as post-capitalist and that it will be a global order as we have a capitalist global order now uh, of a kind but one that is in rapid uh, transition. The argument is uh, totally functional. We need a different set of institutions, a different way to allocate resources, a different way to share income, a different way to engage in problem solving to face the kinds of problems that we have in the 21st century. And uh, I will mention a number of those problems and why None of them is especially susceptible to the invisible hand. The claim of capitalism is that the invisible hand is, by and large, the right approach because it solves a lot of problems. And I think historically there is an important measure of truth that Adam Smith pointed a path to wealth and wealth accumulation that was extremely pertinent, important, historically validated in its ways, though one shouldn't say a sentence like that without also acknowledging the unbelievable cruelty and violence that uh, also was part and parcel of the capitalist system from the very, very start. But we knew already, and Adam Smith told us in Book 5 of The Wealth of Nations, uh, some of the reasons why the invisible hand was uh, uh, limited, by the way, in the debates about Smith, uh, about uh, the meaning of that phrase and his his views, I've, I've also, I think, like many of us, been thinking long and, and hard and reading a lot about his use of the phrase, and I think it was really a religious phrase and a belief in providentialism of a self-ordered system, something like the solar system, but in the economic sphere. He recognized that it 
would not be so self-ordered in every dimension. So book five of the Wealth of Nations is about various kinds of collective action, uh, especially around primary education and infrastructure. But the gist of the book is not only a brilliant disquisition of trade specialization uh, and uh, the functioning of a market economy, but it is a claim that it is, by and large, uh, a self-organized uh, system that can function in a self-organized way. I think that this is less and less true of the problems that we have today, in part because of the successes also of wealth accumulation. Accumulation of wealth is not the major challenge of economic life in the 21st century. Uh, even when we regard the problems of development, because those problems are conceptually not hard to solve. They require different institutional approaches, but not conceptually hard to solve. So I think we're moving to a new kind of economy based on sustainable development, uh, which is a term of art, not just a, a phrase. Uh, it's marked by more solidaristic institutions and a relative diminution of the role of market forces in allocation, in distribution, and in innovation, meaning that allocation of resources is much more through collective uh, budgetary actions, for example. Distribution is much less based on market returns and much more based on, uh, uh, on, on uh, a range of uh, provisions uh, and, and uh, endowments. And innovation is uh, relatively less the work of entrepreneurs and relatively more the work of systems, uh, systems of science and innovation, including our university. And my argument is that we have six major uh, large-scale disruptors of the 21st century that are profoundly disruptive and that the invisible hand cannot handle any of these adequately. Of course, this would require a long discussion, and I'm just touching briefly on these points, but uh, so be it. First uh, is the Anthropocene. The ecological crisis is extraordinarily severe. Uh, we know that every day from the reports of uh, COP26, but not just that. We know that every day from the tumult in the world. It was the function of the Earth Institute in part to help uh, Wally Broker and uh, Jim Hansen get their message out, which is that the Earth systems are profoundly disrupted and uh, reaching extraordinarily dangerous tipping points on many dimensions of climate, biodiversity, ecosystem functioning. And suffice it to say, we're in the midst of disruptions that are going to accelerate and have a profoundly uh, dangerous and devastating effects on large parts of the global population. We cannot solve these problems through market forces alone, though market forces will play some.